Welcome to Free Thoughts. I'm Trevor Burris. And I'm Aaron Powell. Joining us today is Christy Ford Chapin, an Associate Professor of History at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, and a visiting scholar at Johns Hopkins University. She's the author of Ensuring America's Health, the Public Creation of the Corporate Healthcare System. Welcome to Free Thoughts, Christy. Thank you for having me. Your book is a fascinating history of how we have a convoluted and dysfunctional medical system, uh, or how we got there. And a big player in that book is the American Medical Association. When did the American Medical Association start, and, and what was it like at the beginning? Well, it was founded in 1847. And when it was founded during the 19th century, it wasn't particularly powerful. Um, it was during a period before the discovery of germ theory, so physicians were having a lot of difficulty just establishing themselves um, as a profession that was prestigious. Uh, and uh, convincing their patients, for example, that they had expertise that was over and above, uh, for example, perhaps a midwife or some type of alternative practitioner, like a eclectic practitioner or a homeopathic uh, physician. And but that so by the say 1880s or so when they started getting more professionalized. Yeah, so the 1880s is with the discovery of germ theory, so the first time we have effective medications and vaccines and such. Um, and that was very widely covered. It wasn't like this was something that occurred in academia and nobody knew what was going on. This was covered in the newspapers and people were very excited about all the things that were going on with medicine. Um, and so this gave the AMA and physicians a lot more power. And what they had wanted for so long, going back to the 18th century, uh, is licensing law so that only so that they could have some type of control over who could call themselves a physician and practice as a doctor. There were some weak licensing laws that were already in place. Uh, there had been some passed at the end of the 18th century, beginning of the 19th century. A lot of those were actually uh, overthrown during the um, 1830s and such during the, the Jacksonian period. So now that they had this new expertise and they were starting to enjoy a lot more social standing, they were using that power to get licensing laws either strengthened or passed at the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th century. And this was really key to the power that they would exercise over the healthcare market because um, with their control, the power they had over hospitals and the power they had over licensing boards, they were able to act the AMA Association, its leaders were able to act as the regulators of the healthcare market. At the time that they were doing this, uh, that they were agitating for licensing, how many physicians were members of the ANA? Like what portion of them were? Was it most of them? Well, at the end of the 19th, the beginning of the 20th century, they would have still been in the process of establishing um, medical associations in states, counties, and cities. So that's one thing that, that gave them a lot of powers. You have the National Association headquartered in Chicago, then each state has an association, and then physicians join the association if they're accepted at the local, city, or county level. So during this period, as you can imagine, with you know the country expanding out west, they're still expanding the association. Um, but I would say the height of their membership you really see during the post-World War II period, but they're building up to that. Um, say by the early 1950s, they have, oh, about 70 to 75 percent of physicians um, who are practicing. Um, and so, well, 70 to 75 percent of um, physicians, but you could imagine that people, for example, who uh, were still in training or retired might not belong. So at that point, they were, you know, all through, I would say, the first half of the 20th century, they were growing in power. So then when, when they were pushing for the – when they were first pushing for the licensing, was there much debate? Were there physicians who disagreed with this or was it kind of – all physicians, whether they were members or not, were, were pretty on board with licensing. Most physicians were on board with licensing, even the ones who hadn't gone to fully accredited medical societies or even there were physicians who, who excuse me, fully accredited medical schools. Um, there were even physicians practicing at the end of the 19th, the beginning of the 20th century, who had only done an apprenticeship, and that's it. But with the licensing laws, they would have grandfathered all them in. So the vast majority of your physicians would want this because they would understand that it would cut down the, on the supply of medical practitioners and increase their fees. It seems that the, the story kind of kicks off after we have the licensing and the increased professionalization of, of doctors via the AMA 
in the first few decades of the 20th century, but it really kicks off in the 1930s when, when things have changed a bunch. We have more corporatized system. We have a bigger economy. We have even more uh, professionalized medical guild, and, and they start being concerned about how people are paying for health care. So talk a little bit about what was going on there. Okay. So as you can imagine, with the discovery of um, germ theory and all the excitement around medicine and all the new treatments um, that work so well and the advances in surgery and such, um, medical prices were rising. So uh, people being clever as they are were finding all kinds of different ways to pay for health care. They wanted to have some mechanism of budgeting for it um, because, as you know, with health care costs, you can have a... Um, incur large costs very quickly and it's very it could be very difficult to um, forecast and budget and save for so what you ended up having um, happen is that all kinds of different groups came up with ways of financing and delivering health care so for example you had unions uh, using a portion of their membership fees to contract with physicians and even hospitals and unions had all types of different models. They even had one type of model where they actually just employed physicians to work for them. You also had businesses experimenting with different models. Um, for example, they might just hire a physician and have that uh, physician on staff um, to practice industrial medicine, to be looking after the workers, and then eventually expand that to their families as well. There were also consumer cooperatives. A lot of farmers um, were over consumer cooperatives and, and contracting with physicians that way. Uh, mutual aid societies and fraternal orders that tended to represent um, African Americans and then a number of ethnic groups, whether Jewish or Irish or um, Polish, Croatian, you name it, everybody had their mutual aid association. And these were kind of like social clubs, but they also, again, with their membership fees, would buy life insurance and then eventually also started doing things like contracting with physicians. Uh, in fact, in, in the South, you even had one African-American uh, mutual aid society that got so large they built their own hospital uh, for members uh, uh, to use. So you had all these different kinds of models, but the model that I, I often talk a lot about because it was what physicians really like to do, uh, and it seems the way the market probably would have gone, um, would have been a dominant model in the market if it, if it had not been shut down, uh, were the prepaid physician groups. Um, and these were multi-specialty groups. So imagine one-stop shopping. Imagine you go to one place and your general practitioner is there and your cardiologist and surgeon and there's pediatrician and all these different specialties are there. Um, so they offered high quality integrated medicine and physicians like practicing this way because they could sit down at the end of the day if they had a difficult case and talk about it, figure it out, learn across specialties. Um, so that's one reason they liked it. But the other thing is that it was genius the way they set it up because uh, it kept costs in check. Uh, with the insurance company model that we have today, and I know we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that, uh, we have very large cost problems in that the, the United States is getting close to spending one-fifth of its GDP on healthcare. So we are the number one spenders in the world. And the second place spenders are all the way back at 12, 12, 13%. So something is going wrong. Yes, we have high quality medicine, but something is going wrong in uh, as far as overutilization. But we can talk about that in, in a second. With the prepaid physician groups, what was so uh, clever about them is they tied physicians to the bottom line in a way that incentivized them to not want to either give too many services and procedures or to ration care. So the way this worked is people would pay a set monthly fee, either for their family or the individual. And then the physicians acted as insurers. There's no insurance company, no third party in between. And each physician paid a set salary and then a portion of uh, the profits, whether every quarter or biannually or however they set it up. So the physician's best interest is for this prepaid group to make a lot of money. So the last thing they want to do is ration care and have their customers leave unhappy and go tell people, hey, don't bother signing up for that prepaid group. You know, they're very stingy. They, they don't take good care of you. On the other hand, it wasn't in their best interest to just 
order every single service and procedure possible to run up a bill because that would have still been coming out of their back pocket. Moreover, they were incentivized to keep their patients healthy because that would also uh, help them earn more money. So it was a very popular way. There were hundreds and hundreds of these prepaid groups all throughout the country. Um, progressive healthcare reformers were very um, interested in this model. In fact, uh, when Truman attempts to pass comprehensive health care reform, uh, one of the ideas is that uh, some of his administration officials want to go back to this model because people recognize that it's efficient and also delivers high quality care. So this sounds like what you're describing sounds like Kaiser Permanente. Is it is it a similar setup? No. <laughs> No, the problem with Kaiser Permanente is um, it is not run by um, physicians. You have a third party. So Kaiser Permanente, as you well know, is was a court, was a company. It was a business that did things like build roads, and then of course during the war they did a lot of shipbuilding, built dams and such. So they were a, a business not in the business of healthcare, but they ended up contracting with a physician group uh, in order to provide healthcare for. Um, for their employees. The difference is it's overseen by a business and um, so it's, it's business people running it rather than physicians and also the physicians are paid on salary. So they're not bought into the program. They're not tied to the bottom line like the prepaid physician groups. Moreover, even though Kaiser Permanente has different departments of different specialties in one place, they're not set up the way these prepaid physician groups were that were they would have had fewer patients so that you you don't have Kaiser Permanente physicians getting together or being able to um, to talk about patients and, and consider a, a case like you would with these prepaid physician groups. Um, I think having the third party in there is, is important uh, because you really have a business supervising physicians instead of physicians in charge of themselves. There is a model though. We did an episode a few years ago with a with a doctor named Ryan Newhoffel who runs in this direct primary care model, which has a prepay fee. Is that more? That's becoming much more popular. Is that more like what these doctor groups were? Exactly. So the problem is with all systems, they either tend to run into problems of rationing care or over providing care. Um, Kaiser Permanente, when you hear complaints about it, it tends to be about rationing care because the physicians are on a set salary. So you see how they're not tied to caring whether Kaiser Permanente turns a profit or their particular site turns a profit that year. So the direct primary care is much more like what I'm describing, except for they are now, as they're rolling out, and this makes a lot of sense, as they're developing, they're first starting with general practitioners. They're not multi-specialty, but it is certainly an experiment that I'm very interested in and excited to see developing. So what did the AMA think of these prepaid doctor groups if, if they seem to do a lot of at least economically efficient things and provide good health care? How did the AMA react? Well, the AMA, um, until really the end of the 1930s, was against physician groups, especially multi-specialty. You know, today, most all physician groups are single specialty. And they also were, believe it or not, against any kind of insurance. So they were against any kind, it would also be called prepaid services. They were against any kind of insurance or prepaid services. Uh, because they were so afraid of some third party, whether a business or a mutual aid society or a union or any kind of third party getting involved in the healthcare field and taking power away from them. So that makes sense and is rational somewhat, but they, I think they really shot themselves in the foot by viewing the prepaid physician groups the same way. But there's a couple reasons that they did. They were afraid that these prepaid physician groups would turn into corporations probably more along the lines of Kaiser Permanente. Because of course, during this period, you know, you have at the end of the 19th century, the rise of, of the corporation. This is very, this causes a lot of concern and anxiety amongst workers and certainly professionals. Uh, what the physicians don't want to happen is they don't want to get sucked into a big bureaucratic hierarchy and have to work for somebody else. Basically, they don't want to be they don't want to be like the accountants or the engineers who get pulled into the corporation. So they're trying to keep um, away any type of corporate organization. 
And then they're also fearful that if they organize the market, it'll be easier for the government to step in and create a, a program. And they, they're looking at Europe and thinking about this. They're thinking about things that were similar to a lot of the different models I'm talking about um, going on in, say, England or Germany and how those are countries where early on with Germany, the 1880s, uh, with England, 1911, that you have the government entering into uh, the healthcare market to fund services. But they eventually go with insurance, and they feel compelled to for some interesting reasons. One of them being that that there's an antitrust suit. There seems to be a really interesting, almost coincidence, where there's an antitrust suit that the the government is bringing against them, and then they eventually come out and they say insurance. Exactly. So the antitrust suit is pretty important, but what I think is even more important is that during the 1930s, of course, you have all this unprecedented experimentation uh, as far as economic policy goes at the federal level. And um, as many of your listeners will know, the 1935 Social Security Act gets passed, creating Social Security, um, unemployment benefits, what we often call uh, welfare with funding the state welfare programs. And when that passes, um, the people creating that legislation really want to put health care funding in there, too. Um, Roosevelt, you know, consummate politician that he is, very savvy, realizes that, you know, that could sink the entire bill if he has opposition for phys from physicians. So he very politically astutely says no. Um, but that really starts, um, the kicks off what we will see is um, attempt after attempt at the federal level for the federal government to get more involved in health care, to create some kind of programming or financing to provide health care for people. That's what really gets the AMA leaders very nervous. So what they decide to do is, is make a compromise. Um, they still don't want to see anything like multi-specialty groups, but they reluctantly uh, agree to accept insurance, but, and this is the big but, it's only going to be the kind of insurance they approve. The Kaiser Permanente will always be there and be a little pesky, but it's going to be pretty minor. Um, they're able to drive out a lot of the other models just by revoking the licenses of physicians that don't follow what they say. And they're able to, what they're able to do is create their very own insurance model. And the insurance model that they create and really kind of just pull out of thin air, you have a few national AMA leaders doing this, uh, it's, it's very inefficient and costly. I mean, as you can imagine, because the market doesn't kind of naturally come up with it on its own, they just make it up. You know, they just, they get together and make it up and they decide that, okay, if we have to accept insurance, you know, and we're going to accept insurance in, in, in order um, for political reasons to tell policymakers that we don't need them to get involved. The private market's doing just fine. We're now supporting insurance. We're helping spread it. But they decide the best way to protect themselves is to have um, only insurance companies funding insurance. OK, so no unions, no prepaid physician groups, no consumer cooperatives, mutual aid societies, all of that. They're going to continue to do everything they can to stop and, and, and do a very effective job of shutting most of those down and, and preventing their growth. Um, but the reason they decide that they only want to work with insurance companies is because insurers during this period are just headquartered usually in one place. And if you think that they're financing physicians all over the country, in the minds of AMA leaders, well, okay, now there's a third party involved in medicine, but at least they're way far away. So they can't come and supervise us and tell us what to do. Whereas a prepaid group, right, it's it, everything is local or a union, everything is local. So this is the bet they're making. They create this model. Only insurers can finance it. Um, no mul no multi-specialty groups. Um, a big key to this is fee-for-service payment, that physicians are to be paid for every single service and procedure they offer. So they cannot be paid a set fee, a set capitation fee, like a set annual fee for each patient they take, um, or even a set office fee for each time a, uh, a patient comes in. If a patient visits the office and they provide a number of, of services, say they take their blood, they do certain tests, labs, diagnostics, they can charge a separate fee for each and every one of those um, services. Um, so that's one of the keys to starting to really drive healthcare cost problems is you're incentivizing physicians. And I think we can all see how this would happen. I'm, I'm sure all of us would, 
end up going along with something like this too, you're in your mind rationalizing that you're giving your patients gold standard care, right? Um, it's also a way to make up, for example, for all the charity medicine you might be giving away. And initially, also physicians are allowed to set their own fees. Now, they, they can't do that anymore. Now they follow fee schedules. But initially, um, they're setting their own fees. So you have problems with um, bill padding. And then again, even if you are the most you know, careful, ethical, scrupulous physician, you are supposed to set your fees with what's in the area. You're not supposed to weigh undercut other physicians. So if you're just going along with what everybody else is doing, you see how your, your fees are going to creep up. Um, kind of artificially, not because of market conditions, but because they're just deciding what they want to bill because they're not worried about it. It's not like they're asking their patient for all this money. They're asking a far away, faceless, impersonal, you know, unpersonal um, corporation for this money. So this is creates a big problem. What did patients think of all this as this change was happening? Well, patients probably didn't really realize this was going on. Um, they were very, patients were very, very happy with the prepaid physician groups um, that I mentioned. Um, now, some of, some of what the AMA was doing to shut down the other models was covered in the press. And so people were unhappy about that who were aware of what was happening. Otherwise, a lot of patients would have been getting their insurance through their employers. And they probably wouldn't be thinking too terribly much about how um, this was being organized. I would say a lot of rank and file physicians were unhappy with the way the AMA was um, conducting itself because really you have a few elite leaders making these decisions where the rank and file physicians, they would be happy to practice in prepaid groups or contract with a farmer's consumer cooperative or a mutual aid society. But you have the AMA printing warnings in the Journal of the American Medical Association saying, if you do this, we will come after you and get your license revoked. Or also they would get their hospital admitting privileges revoked. Or they would get expelled from the medical society, which meant they wouldn't be able to buy malpractice insurance. So they were very, they were able to, and, and I even have seen places where some of the physicians who were running these alternative models said, yeah, there are plenty of physicians who'd like to work with me, but they say they can't because they're afraid. They're afraid to come and take a job with me because they're afraid of the repercussions on their um, career with what the AMA would do. So I think the physicians recognize what's going on, but they end up having, if they want to keep their careers, um, the, the only ones who are really able to fight it are the ones that are have enough press or somebody politically powerful enough to protect them. Otherwise, there's there's nothing they can do. Um, so the physicians just have to go along um, with what the AMA insists on. Well, that's what I was asking about because some of these tactics that they used to t uh, threaten license, to threaten referrals, hospital admitting privileges, uh, they that seems to violate antitrust law and at one time the Justice Department actually did try to say that they were violating antitrust law, which maybe incentivized them to make a switch. Um, right. And that was in the early 1940s, that antitrust suit. They weren't happy, of course, that they got ruled against because they felt like they were allowed. They got caught in Washington, D.C., basically going to hospitals and telling the hospitals to turn out any physicians who were involved with this model. That was um, the, It was a cooperative group that was kind of similar to Kaiser Permanente that um, federal employees were working with. Um, so they were upset about that, but there wasn't still a lot the government could do about um, some of the ways they were able to pull licenses. I mean, that was very specifically with a hospital case. They were able to still exert a lot of this pressure. Uh, the government wasn't able to go and say, well, you kick these people out of the medical society. None of that was ever followed up on. So that was kind of a slap on the wrist. You know, it was somewhat important, but also by this point, the AMA comes up and creates the insurance company model in 1938. So they're already starting to roll with this is the model that we are supporting, that we're holding up to policymakers saying, we do not need healthcare reform. The private market's doing just fine. We are, we have this insurance. You know, they're just calling it insurance. They're not saying it's, you know, the insurance company model or a specific model. So what you have is really, especially by the end of the 40s and into the 50s, um, you see physicians and insurers very explicitly saying, 
because neither of them are very happy about this. The AMA wasn't happy about having to do, to accept an insurance, especially the leaders and insurance companies. Their leaders were not happy about getting involved with this because they looked at what the AMA demanded and said, this is crazy. This is going to drive up costs. This, this doesn't make any sense, but they kind of reluctantly get pulled in as well because they want to help the AMA defeat um, what they would say socialized medicine or any kind of universal comprehensive um, program coming out of the government because there's this idea among businessmen, you know, coming out of World War II that if the healthcare sector falls, so to speak, to comprehensive federal uh, management or nationalization, then that's going to set a precedent that's going to um, sweep through many other economic sectors. So the insurance companies are thinking we're going to step forward, you know, kind of take the, the the bullet on this one and work with the AMA to expand this fundamentally flawed, <laughs> fundamentally inefficient, really harebrained idea of an I uh, of a model, this insurance company model, and they're racing to cover as many people as they can, especially in the 50s. And every meeting, every board of trustees meeting, annual meeting, every time physicians and insurers get together to talk about healthcare and 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 the healthcare market, they repeatedly say we have to expand it and we have to make the policies more generous in order to beat back federal reform. So they're really organizing the market as a political answer, more than being concerned about efficiency and market structure and such. Um, because even though Truman's plan is defeated by the early 1950s, his plan for universal care, what a lot of people overlook is all throughout the Eisenhower administration, people are trying to reform health care. Because even the ones who are against Truman's bill, say some of the conservative Democrats and the Republicans, they still agree with the premise that this model is faulty and it's not going to be able to cover enough people. So Eisenhower offers a reinsurance reform program, and then you have numerous groups in Congress. Sometimes they're bipartisan, um, sometimes they're entirely Republican, offering different reform programs uh, in order to expand insurance to more of the population. And the whole time, the insurers and physicians are going to them and saying, we don't need this. We are look at how quickly we're expanding coverage. Look at how much more generous we're making insurance. We do not need you getting involved in the market. What did the overall economics look like at the time? Because right now, the you know the problem with our existing insurance thing is that costs just keep going up for a variety of reasons. But a lot of that has to do with you know technological change, and we've got access to more kinds of care, but it happens to be expensive care or longer end of life care that seemed like they might not have been as much of a problem. So was it – was economically this system at least holding up back then better than it is now? Well, I would disagree with you about the technology argument. I know it's something that a lot of people put forward and I think, yes, technology of course is going in, and actually as you say too, the number uh, of procedures we have and diagnostics and such available and, and increased hospitalization because people actually want to go to hospitals now. They're not just you know death traps for the poor. Um, but technology is not driving costs to the degree that a lot of people say it is. Um, it's really this model that is. And if you look at the statistics from this period, it's 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 pretty clear as well. Um, so, for example, um, at the end of the 1940s, really when this insurance company model is taking hold, say you have like 30 percent of the population covered by now with it. This is when you see the cost increase for healthcare. You know, they jump up in the CPI and um, the consumer price index higher than any other bucket of spending, whether it's transportation, housing, clothing, entertainment, what, whatever it may be. And it pretty much stays there, increasing in price um, more dramatically than any other uh, type of cost all the way through, of course, the 40s, 50s, and of course, the 60s. Now, we often hear the story that, oh, cost really came, became a problem after Medicare and Medicaid passed in 1965. They were already a huge problem before that. In fact, if you go back and even look at the media coverage during the time, you can see it there um, because the insurance cost, like a, the cost of a policy is going up 10, 20, 30 percent every year. And there's also um, somewhat of a, um, an epidemic of unnecessary surgery going on because we talked about the problem with the fee for service and, and the insurance companies not allowed to supervise um, or ask any questions of physicians. Um, so of course you had overutilization and fee padding, but unfortunately you did have some outright fraudulent physicians who would just 
you know, perform surgeries in order to collect a quick fee. And this started being discovered by the pathologists and the hospitals who, you know, would realize afterwards, hey, you know, 70% of the hysterectomies we, we did were not medically necessary. Or, you know, say with a appendectomy, you know, you expect to find, okay, maybe 10% or so, the, the, the tissue wasn't diseased, we guessed wrong. You certainly don't expect to find 60, 70% or more of um, healthy organs coming out. And so you start seeing this, this crisis of unnecessary surgery. Um, I think across the decade, I believe the number is um, the number of services and procedures ordered to go along with a patient um, for each hospital admission increases sixfold. Now, yes, some of that's going to be technology, new procedures and diagnostics, but not times six. That, that is a lot more than, than technology can account for. And um, also, for example, you have Blue Cross, which is a big hospital insurer during this period, and of course still is. Um, their studies show that, for example, approximately one third of all hospital admissions aren't even necessary. But it's an easy way to get the patient in somewhere where it's paid for and then order a lot of different tests and services and procedures um, to either run up a bill, but there are even examples of kind of ridiculous things where a couple wanted to go on their honeymoon but didn't have a place to put their children, and so the doctor admitted them to the hospital because then he could just <laughs> charge Blue Cross. Yeah. <laughs> so you have a lot of, you know, stories like this. So you can, see, you can see why the insurers are concerned because they can't control any of this, right? They can't, um, and, and costs are just, you know, every, the cost of every service and procedure is skyrocketing, and then, of course, the amount. So well before 1965 and the passage of Medicare, um, costs are a huge problem. In the insurance model in general, we have the employer provided, which you mentioned previously existed to some extent in the 30s, but but I don't think that more than 50% of people had health insurance, or I'd be surprised, in the 30s. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. one thing we talk about in the in the policy world, mm -hmm. and you hear from Republicans, is, is the coupling of insurance and your job via a tax break that was instituted immediately after World War II and then put into the tax code. So your compensation package, for, which includes your insurance, is not taxed. Uh, is that Does that have a big role in in growing the insurance model, or did they push that for a specific reason, perhaps hiding costs? That's one thing that that kind of does is it hides costs. How, how does that tax break work? Absolutely. You're right about hiding costs. You don't have consum consumers who get um, insurance to their employers worried about these increases when, um, and I laugh today when people think, well, I only pay $100 a month for my insurance. Yeah, well, you don't see the $30,000 of foregone income every year that you're not getting as your employer pays the rest. So certainly. So going back, a lot of people talk about World War II because of the wage freeze and then employers could attract scarce labor um, with benefits such as health insurance. I think that's been a tiny bit overplayed, and, and I'm pulling from Jacob Packer and Jennifer Klein here. Um, certainly that happened, but really it was, um, it was one of these unintended consequences, small things that going all the way back to 1913 and the setting up of, um, I forget the name then of whatever the IRS was, they made the decision to um, grant businesses a tax break if they provided fringe benefits for their employees. So, of course, this is a good way when you have businesses trying to, to keep union organizing out. This is a nice tool for them to be able to provide like pension packages, life insurance, health insurance um, in order to, you know, make a, a certain argument um, to their workers. So um, that is growing, um, starting to grow in the 30s. At first, insurers don't want to get involved with it, but they do, as, as I just spoke about with the AMA's political idea. And um, so, of course, that's just growing, even without World War II and the wage freeze. That would have continued to grow and grow. Um, and what you see is insurance companies and the AMA actually going and saying to these businesses, we need your help on this political project of expanding insurance to keep the government out of the healthcare sector. Um, so you see them talking to, for example, you know, representatives and officials at the Chamber of Commerce, the National Association of Manufacturers. They're sending material out to their members saying, yes, this is great. You know, it, it helps your, you know, increases, um, you know, decreases turnover with your employees, helps you with unions, but also politically it is very helpful for you um, to expand insurance. And then of course, as you mentioned, 
um, it's very useful in that um, as costs are increasing, the consumers aren't feeling it as much. What you do have, however, are unions and employers coming down later, especially as we get by the mid 1950s, they're really starting to come down on the AMA and insurers and saying, this is ridiculous. You guys keep giving us higher. I mean, the, the cost increases year after year are just untenable. So that's where they're really feeling um, a lot of pressure. And also believe it or not, um, we talk a lot about employee group insurance, but because of this political project with insurers attempting um, to cover as much of the population as they could, they sold a lot more individual policies than you would believe. I wish I had the statistic on me. It, it's a lot more than it was, say, for example, even before the ACA was passed in 2010. I want to say it was at least 20%, if not more, of the policies they sold were to the individual market, which, as you know, that's an increase. Um, there are problems with adverse selection, um, all kinds of problems with selling it um, to individuals, and yet they were doing so in order to be able to go and report before Congress when they went into the hearings that, hey, look at how much um, we have expanded health care. But of course, this becomes more and more difficult um, as the prices are increasing. Now, what is the fundamentally untenable thing about the insurance, the health insurance market? Because it seems that some type of insurance is not crazy, but it also seems that the interplay between what people, what voters and, and politicians demand of the healthcare system and how it's financed, that, that it must cover everything, that the co it must keep costs low, it must uh, keep people alive and cover everything and any possibility, including your you know, standard daily procedures, that there was a, there was a political demand for that coupled with a, a system that can't meet those kind of demands on if it's a, if it's not really insurance at that point that's just a third party payer system and that's sort of what they created by demanding more out of insurance than they could possibly deliver right but i think insurance could could deliver more than we realize so for example with these prepaid groups that i told you operated so efficiently they were actually offering maternity benefits all the way back in the 1930s which is pretty radical that they were able to do that and able to do it with um, profitably because under the insurance company model when for example um, there were some blue cross plans that tried to roll it out in the 1940s and bankrupted themselves because they were using this insurance company model um, so i think the basic untenable the basic problem is people look at insurance and say okay well consumers don't care they don't shop around they don't worry about having overutilization okay that's true to a degree and of course, with the employer market, they don't have a lot of choice as far as insurance plan goes anyway. They get what their employer gives them. If they're lucky, they can ch you know, choose between two or three options. And you know, we can imagine how that would distort, say, for example, the automobile market, if that's the way most people got their automobiles and you could pick between two or three. So um, there's, a, there's that problem. But my argument would be that you've really got to look to see the way the uh, physicians and service providers, so that would include hospitals, are incentivized. That is the key, I think, in, in healthcare systems as you look around the world and in the United States. These are the people with the requisite knowledge to know when a service or procedure should be offered. You know, yes, they're going to sit there and work with the patient, and, and every patient is different. But if you if you don't get that incentive, you know, those incentives right, you're going to run into either rationing or overutilization. Um, so that that's what I would say is is the key to all of this. So, given that the the AMA fought as hard as it did against government involvement in you know government kind of takeover of the healthcare sector and they fought against Truman's plans and and given how much kind of political weight they seem to have how did we get to Medicare and Medicaid So that's a really interesting story because um the ANA and insurers are continuing their you know their attempt to expand insurance to keep uh the federal government out so the Medicaid, the Medicare, excuse me, the Medicare debates really began back in the late 50s, 57, I think it is that um, Congressman Foreign um, offers a bill. And you even have Eisenhower offer a, a, a Medicare type bill as well as a counter to this Democrat congressman's bill. 
So you have these um, ongoing talks about creating some type of um, insurance program for the elderly. Um, in the 1960 presidential election, both Nixon and Kennedy are talking about their plans to create this this insurance program for the elderly. It's pretty much a bipartisan decision. And the reason is, um, well, let's go back to the insurers and the AMA. They're even trying to cover the elderly. And they are going to such lengths to try to cover the elderly that they're actually going to state legislatures petitioning for antitrust exemptions so that numerous insurance companies can get together, pull their resources, pull their administrative capacity, and attempt to try to cover the elderly, even though they have this really expensive model. Now, the insurance they sell the elderly, they really cannot offer them more than hospitalization, even though with all their other policies, they're trying to make them more generous for this, this, this political point of we can do it. Um, but even, you know, with them pulling their resources and offering only pretty stripped down policies, they do get up to covering, believe it or not. Um, I wish I could check the statistic too, but more than 50% of the elderly um, end up being covered before Medicare, but it's still it's still not enough because it's such uh, basic coverage. And um, the insurance companies are actually losing money on these programs. So they're having to take profits from their other underwriting lines, whether it's life insurance or pension packages, to underwrite the losses um, that they're incurring on trying to cover the elderly. So as, as we're getting into Medicare, a lot of insurance companies, particularly larger ones, are not very enthusiastic about opposing Medicare because they see as a way to dump very expensive people to cover. I mean, why do they want to, to continue covering them? Of course, the AMA is, you know, going full bore to oppose Medicare, just as they did with the Truman campaign. Um, but they really run into a lot of problems because at this point, businesses are favorable toward Medi Medicare, so they don't have to deal with retiree benefits. Certainly unions are. And, you know, politicians, you have even Republican politicians showing up to talk to physicians or insurers and saying, look, if you can't cover enough, you know, most of the elderly population with pretty generous insurance, we're going to create a program. If the market can't handle it, we have no problem intervening here. So um, what a lot of people don't realize about Medicare, I, I think a lot of people know it passed on a bipartisan vote. Um, but even the Republicans who didn't vote for Medicare, most of it was because they were supporting a Medicare alternative plan. So it's really the Kennedy-Johnson administration plan that goes through. But there's a political consensus about the need to create a program because there's this idea that the market, it, you know, they expand health insurance from about say 1945, it's covering about 25% of the population. By the time they get up to 1965, it's covering about 80% of the population. So they ran pretty quickly to cover people, but they really tripped up when they got to the very expensive elderly uh, subscribers. Um, so uh, Medicare passes, but what's also very significant about that program is these reformers, and the Social Security Administration, who are working with the congressmen to design this bill, all along, they have wanted to get rid of this insurance company model. That was one of the things they wanted to do under Truman, that not just introduce universal health care managed by the federal government, but they wanted to revert back. They wanted to favor nonprofit plans and also the, the prepaid doctor groups. But they realize by the time we get up to the 1960s that they can't do that. The private sector has built up so much. There's so much organizational capacity and growth in the private sector that the public sector is never going to be able to match. The, the Social Security Administration realizes there's no way we can handle covering, you know, dealing with insurance and physicians and hospitals through the Social Security Administration. So another story of reluctantly, you know, some, they're doing something reluctantly. They end up designing the Medicare program around the insurance company model. So um, pretty much you have insurers um, acting as the administrators. Yes, they have to follow the rules of the program that the Social Security Administration sets out, but they administer the program. They're the go-betweens with the hospitals and the physicians, payments, cost containment procedures, which they had started building up by the mid-1950s and afterward, because as costs are shooting up and they're getting a lot of bad press, uh, the AMA and physicians have to reluctantly agree to let the insurance companies start putting in regulations to try to contain costs. 
Um, there's a lot of conflict around this, but it's, it's really building up by the 1960s. Physicians um, often have to go before utilization review committees that are looking at what they're doing. They might, um, with some insurers, have to get permission before they put a patient into the hospital. Um, their diagnoses are being scrutinized. Um, treatment blueprints are being created. Insurers are becoming experts in medicine themselves as they try to navigate um, different ways they can and try to contain costs. So, of course, um, federal officials are, are thinking, you know, we can't do all of this from scratch. We're going to rely on insurance companies to deal with all of this, all of the working with the hospitals and physicians, because they've already set up all of these procedures and processes, and there's no way we can do that from scratch and roll this plan out anytime soon. And plus, it makes it more politically palatable because we're offering this welfare program, which is very favorable to the middle class, right? Because this isn't like a, a welfare program for the poor. This takes a, a burden off of even wealthy individuals, middle class individuals who don't want to spend money on mom and dad as they're aging. Instead, the idea is, okay, you can save money for your child's education or piano lessons or whatever it may be. Um, so you can see why it's very politically popular. And then federal officials can say, and on top of that, it's going to be the exact same system that, you know, they're, the elderly are going to use the exact same system that you got, everybody's already familiar with. That so. sounds familiar in the sense of it sounds somewhat like the Affordable Care Act, it, it, the the rhetoric around it. Not, uh, obviously, Medicare and Medicaid were huge public programs in a, in a different way. But the same idea that the only way we can reform health care is to keep the model – uh, that we have keep the insurance model. So everything about if you like your if you like your health insurance, you can keep it. I think is what President Obama felt like he kind of had to say, because that that's the the thing that people are familiar with, and no one is thinking outside of that box, including with this last huge reform with the Affordable Care Act. Absolutely, mm -hmm. yeah, because they they realize that would generate so much opposition. So of course, I'm, you might remember the attempt to undermine and get rid of the insurance company model. So of course, the bottom line is the ACA is also built on the insurance company model, but they did try to undermine it with the public option. And you probably remember how um, a lot of Democrats and particularly progressive Democrats wanted to get that public option onto the exchanges with the idea that they could load it up with a lot of benefits. Um, undercut the prices that private insurers could offer and, and then grow from there in order to just stabilize this insurance company model. But of course, the public option doesn't go into the final legislation because they wouldn't be able to pass it. They wouldn't be able to get all the Democrats on board. Uh, and so what we end up with is a program that's built on this same fundamentally unsound, inefficient model um, that not only has all these cost problems, fragmented care, but you also are in a situation where the power you know, situation has reversed in the healthcare system, where it's no longer physicians calling the shots. Now it's insurance companies calling the shots because cost containment programs have built up so much over the decades that you know, I would argue really it's the insurance company deciding how medicine is practiced more so even than physicians in a lot of cases because physicians have to follow standardized treatment blueprints or they won't be compensated. Um, so it takes a lot of the art out of medicine because, you know, they're tied to you have to do it this way. Um, and, you know, your patient might be a little different or respond to something different, but you have to do it the way the insurance company says. Um, so right now we have a situation where insurers aren't just financing health care. They're really at the center of everything. They're managing Medicare. You know, they're in with ACA uh, and they're supervising physicians and hospitals. And that seems pretty ironic because the AMA originally believed that insurance was the best way to avoid governmental control and third party control and then it became the exact opposite. Exactly. <laughs> so, this is a story of a lot of irony. I mean, this so yeah, the very thing that AMA leaders were trying to prevent from happening in the 1930s they ended up creating. Um they pushed all their chips on this one model and and this is what ended up happening. And of course the other irony being that the more federal policymakers, both Republican and Democrat, tried to get rid of this model, the more they embedded it into the system. So, so the the story of roads not taken, it it now seems that having so gone in, deep into the insurance model, 
that we can't go back to these prepaid systems or any of these things or anyone has tried has failed, that the, 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 this road seems to lead more likely to single payer than it does to, to going backwards and reforming the insurance model, which has just proved to be almost impossible. Well, I'd like to be a little more optimistic. <laughs> okay. So, um, and, and this is my optimism. So um, I'll, I'll tell you a little anecdote. So um, I, one of the first podcasts after my book came out, um, I was asked to be on the Sam Cedar show, which is, you might know, is a very progressive, um, uh, liberal progressive podcast. And they wanted to talk to me about these prepaid, per, you know, doctor groups from the 1930s. And I thought this was very random. How did, you know, they figured out that I was an expert in them, but why did they want to talk about this? So I go on and talk about it and they're interested in this idea because it gets rid of the corporate power. It takes the corporate power out of the healthcare market. And then the host tells me, you know, I don't like Sean Hannity. But the, where I found out about this model is from Sean Hannity's program. So then I go over to Sean Hannity's program, and I'm just so interested in seeing both sides. And of course, you know, on the other side, uh, conservatives are interested in the program because of consumer choice and, and more physician autonomy and such. So to me, it's very interesting that there's this, you know, bipartisan interest. And also, um, the, uh, the direct primary care model was mentioned. Um, as something that is trying to go back and recover this past. Um, I think these, these are growing pretty quickly. They would grow a lot more quickly. One thing they have to do is they have to do a lot of lobbying at the state level to get a lot of the regulations that were passed in order to try to rein in costs for the insurance company model. They actually need to get those laws cleared away to allow them to operate. So um, in some states, the AMA had things passed saying, you know, you can't have a corporate health care model. And also, um, for example, a lot of states passed laws saying doctors can't um, dispense their own drugs, own their own labs and diagnostic centers, which makes sense under the insurance company model, because if you let doctors do that, it gives them more things to uh, run up the bill with. Right. Um, but it's those those laws are an impediment to the growth of the prepaid model coming back. But what we do see is we see some lobbying efforts at the state level. Um, it looks like it's, it's, it's moving along pretty well. At the federal level, the only thing they really need is for the federal government um, to allow people with health savings accounts and keep in mind that almost 50% of employers offer health savings accounts now. The problem with health savings account is they don't fundamentally, you know, change the structure of the system. But, um, so health savings accounts allow you to buy one type of insurance. So these groups are trying to um, convince the federal government to just change the rules so that you can purchase two types of insurance. You could purchase um, this insurance directly from this dir direct primary group and then also purchase uh, a catastrophic insurance policy. And these groups are seeing, you know, great things with, you know, efficiently delivering care, prices coming down. They're able to deliver medicine very, very cheaply uh, compared to the model we have now, uh, including prescription drugs and such. Um, but it is different right now state to state based on what has been done at the state government level. And then, of course, holding out to see if people with HSAs can start to to choose these options as, as they are founded and, and created in, in their, their town. So it doesn't have to end in single payer. No. Yeah, we can we can we can start growing these out, and, and as I mentioned before, we we have a previous episode discussing the direct primary care model. So possibly if we grow this out, we can we can reverse this flow. But it, it we also have Medicare for all. Everyone's saying Medicare for all, and that that force is going in that direction too. Yeah, but the irony of that is you have progressive Democrats like you know championing a corporate power based system. Now, of course, they'll tell you, well, we're going to get rid of the insurance companies if they think that far. I don't I think a lot of them have. Any, but they'll tell you, it doesn't matter. You still have the same model. OK, so now you're going to have the government acting in that same position. We've seen that this model is broken. Why, for the love of Pete, would you want to expand it and embrace it? It is. If you want to go universal health care, there are ways to do it. And Medicare for all is not that way because it's going to create such a massively inefficient system. Um, if you're going to go universal care, it has to be. We need to think about the structure of the market. It is so important the way people are incentivized. We can't just act like incentives don't matter.
Thanks for listening. Free Thoughts is produced by Tess Terrible. If you enjoyed today's show, please rate and review us on iTunes. And if you'd like to learn more about libertarianism, find us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.